Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for staying here till the end. Um, this, I guess I'll be the last talk, uh, which means I can go way over time. So <laughs> the doors are already locked, and don't worry. About it. Uh, today, I want to talk about seasonal animal behaviors uh, through that we can try to gloss through isotopic analysis of their teeth. In particular, I want to try to uh, explore the variability of these animal behaviors within an assemblage of sampled teeth uh, through formal modeling, which will allow us to understand uh, possibly different adaptations that animals are having around a site or around a community, uh, either that would affect either how people are hunting these animals or maybe how people are managing uh, different animal populations. Uh, so Julia gave a great uh, talk about all of the different ways that different kinds of animals can be big indicators of seasonality around uh, different communities. Uh, the presence uh, and life cycles of plants and animals around a community sort of punctuate seasonal changes uh, that might help sort of the conception of time uh, within a community and sort of how, what kind of activities people could do. Uh, so for migratory animals, uh, the presence of these animals uh, would be an important uh, factor for uh, what kind of time it is in the year uh, or indicators of how the seasons are changing. Uh, you also have life cycle changes like the blooming of different uh, plants or the sort of life cycle of animals around, uh, around a community. Uh, these differences in the availability and edibility of different plants and animals around uh, underlie seasonal changes in a community's food. Uh, and what food would be available to people, particularly if you're using uh, wild resources rather than animals that you're managing. Uh, the more punctuated these differences are, the more likely people are to invest in certain kinds of strategies uh, that might mitigate seasonality's effects on food availability, uh, either through movement or different kinds of social strategies. Uh, some of these strategies might involve longer storage, uh, longer term storage of food, uh, but for animals, particularly before refrigeration, which is most of archaeology, um, in most parts of the world, at least, uh, animal food might be, or animal meat might be shared out to other groups to try and uh, convert uh, animal meat into social bonds that might be longer lasting over larger seasonal terms. This is some of the ideas uh, that Rich mentioned for why there might be feasting in different kinds of, or some of the social roles of feasting uh, in some forms. So it gets to more political roles that he's more interested in. But for me, I like people to get along. In general, we can investigate seasonal <coughs> behaviors of animals, particularly uh, ruminants, large herbivores, uh, <coughs> by analyzing isotopic signals in uh, their tooth enamel by serially analyzing across the growth axis of the tooth. Uh, because enamel is biologically inactive once it's mineralized, uh, you end up capturing sort of a time average of part of an animal's behavior during that time that their tooth was growing. Uh, so by sampling across it, you get a sort of general view of what environments this animal is going through while it was, while its tooth was developing, so in the first several years of its life. In general, these are cattle teeth here. Uh, and the isotopes that I'm going to focus on today are oxygen and carbon isotopes, uh, which have up here sort of some of the differences of an environment that it's tracking. So oxygen isotopes, uh, which might also be called D18O, or a delta 18 if you have a fancy uh, keyboard. Uh, <laughs> but uh, generally, uh, these values will vary in an animal's uh, tooth enamel, uh, will vary with the uh, relationship between precipitation and evaporation in the environment, in the uh, water that the animal is drinking while its tooth is developing. So, in continental areas, as a gross oversimplification, in the summer it gets drier, uh, there might be less rain, and so you have more evaporation than precipitation, and this D18O will go up because you have a higher concentration of that heavier element. Uh, and so, as you get more evaporation, this value gets more positive. Um, they're generally going to be sort of negative values, but it's still going up. And then in winters, or continental winters, uh, if you have seasonal rainfall, you're going to have more precipitation, and so more of the lighter oxygen is coming in, and this value goes back down. So you'll see this kind of uh, sinusoidal uh, curve going up and down throughout a year, tracking sort of long-term uh, precipitation seasonality effects. 
For carbon, uh, it's slightly different because uh, carbon, uh, the two isotopes are carbon-13 and carbon-12. Uh, and we again, we track how much of the heavier, the concentration of the heavier element uh, in this tooth enamel carbonate. Uh, you're again, uh, as this gets heavier, it's related to the what kind of plants and animals eat it. And so in general, different plants will vary somewhat based on their, uh, vary in these carbon values based on the photosynthetic efficiency or the kind of biology that they have. So for most plants, they have a certain way of producing sugar uh, through photosynthesis, uh, that, and they're turned to the C3 plants. There are other kinds of plants, uh, mainly sort of grasses or dry adaptive plants, certain kinds of grasses and dry adaptive plants that follow a different pathway that creates more positive values on this. So if you see values go up, like here, this might be an indication that there's more of these C4 plants in an animal's diet over this time, um, or that the animal or the plants are growing in slightly different growing conditions. There are other little details that make everything more complicated. Uh, but in general, I'm going to say C4 means positive. Uh, summer means positive. It's different thing. All right. So a typical oxygen profile, if you don't have lots of cash, like Rich mentioned, um, is going to look like this. So you'll have about maybe six this is six samples for a tooth's growth. So you see. We're all basing this uh, relative to the distance from the root of the tooth, uh, where the enamel starts, uh, going up to where the end of it would be, which would depend on how tall the tooth was that you're sampling. And so you've got, again, these are the oxygen values, and you see that they kind of increase and then they decrease, and there's sort of a pattern going on. You can kind of tell, okay, if I know that that's going to be the summer, because I remembered three slides ago, uh, then it goes up and then it goes back down. So we have an idea that Somewhere within the growth of this tooth, you have this. Unfortunately, this makes it very hard to compare different teeth uh, because teeth can either start at different times, teeth can be different lengths. And so you don't know if, okay, well, does it matter that about 20 millimeters from the uh, tooth root is when the summer is ending, presumably, something like that. It's also, I only have six samples. If I do more, am I going to get even higher values or lower values, or what's going to go on? So to be able to uh, summarize teeth in a way that you can fruitfully compare them, uh, there have been some modern uh, or recent uh, developments to sort of formally model these values uh, as they increase and decrease. Uh, I mentioned sinusoidal. Uh, it's sort of using, uh, a, using an equation that creates a sinusoidal cur curve that would relate sort of relative distance from a tooth root to an expected isotopic value. And so the benefits of this is instead of saying, here's a specific, you know, at 10 millimeters away, this is what the value would be, you're instead using uh, or producing a, a sort of relative form that you say from seasonal peak to seasonal peak. So from what would be here, sort of a winter peak to winter peak, if we want to interpret it that way, uh, this is how much tooth enamel ground that we cover. And so now we can start saying, I can standardize all of these relative to the amount of time it takes for, or the amount of enamel <coughs> it takes for a cow's values or an animal's values to go uh, from one end, or from one winter peak to another winter peak. Uh, so this is a useful sort of parameter to be able to start fruitfully comparing these different uh, isotopic values. There are other parameters that this equation uh, uses to be able to really just summarize, I had all of these six points before, now I can summarize it down to three values, I'm getting fewer things. This is good. Um, and so the mean value, uh, this solid line here, shows the value around which all of these uh, swings are going. And so that mean value gives you a good idea of what an average diet over the course of a year would be. Because before, you know, most of the samples that I took here might have been sort of around the summer for that animal. So if I'm comparing just the average of my sampled values, that's going to be different from something that's mainly going to be in the winter. Um, even with this, you can see there's very little actually that got on the winter in some ways. So we have that, and we have an amplitude, which is also how far up and down these values are going from that mean value. So that amplitude can also give us a sense of how drastic are the summer and winter changes going on, or how drastic are these seasonal signals. Because some animals might be able to mitigate these in different ways. And these are the kinds of 
periodicity, mean values, amplitudes, these are the kinds of parameters that we can now start to compare across different, uh, different teeth, largely within an assemblage because we don't, that way we're dealing with similar uh, kinds of environmental factors that would be causing these changes, uh, but it allows us to start comparing things across. Maybe. So first, we can fit these things, but again, we only have limited uh, resources. And so we're only going to do five or six samples uh, because we also have limited time. Uh, and eventually we need to publish things and tell other people about this stuff. And so we can fit any kind of line. You, you can fit any line that you want to any set of data. It's an amazing thing about uh, math. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, when you only have sort of these many uh, value or these many data points, uh, you can get pretty different looking or somewhat different looking curves. They still go up and they go down, uh, based off of different initial uh, values from which you say, find me the best way, find me the best fitting line, uh, and I'm going to say it starts with the periodicity at 30 millimeters for a year. Uh, or 40 millimeters per year, and then the computer will go done, and then it will give you a line. Um, and these values, again, they look sort of different, but they're all being like, this is the best way to fit that line from wherever we started. Uh, and so you kind of get to a point, first off, people aren't going to necessarily say what your initial parameters are. Second off, what is a good initial parameter for this? We don't know a good initial estimate for how many <coughs> millimeters per tooth miller, uh, mineralizes you know, even if we did, that should probably be different from animal to animal. And so you can get some good ideas, but you're going to, it's all going to kind of be guesswork uh, that gives you these really precise ideas uh, if you're not careful about challenging the assumptions. Any set of these values, I could report and you would be like, wow, that's very fancy, but it's going to be the same. There's no reason why I'm picking this one over that one, except that one has more of curves, so it looks nice. One of the uh, strategies people have used, uh, as Rich has mentioned, has to take a lot of samples. So this is now 22 samples on a tooth, which is nothing like the 52. But that's still a lot. This is, again, now going to be, you're going to have a third of the animals uh, for the same amount of samples, essentially. A third to a fourth. And this creates a trade-off that is sort of a trade-off in understanding what happened to this one animal versus what happened to the animals in an assembly. And so these are both good, and they're both aims, and these are things that anyone can make like a decision as to what you want to focus on, but you're still going to have a trade-off happening that <coughs> will sort of affect uh, your interpretations of the past. Furthermore, both the carbon and the oxygen are occurring from the same uh, you're studying these isotopic values from the same uh, mineral, from the carbonate in the teeth. So ostensibly, you would assume carbonate has both the carbon and the oxygen uh, going into it at the same rate. And so that periodicity should be the same. But when you only do uh, these sort of best fit algorithms to fit this, you end up with periodicities. These are both <coughs> periodicities here that are going to be different because you're fitting to that line the best way that you can. So you're not only having issues of what is my best initial parameter, I have issues of what is my best initial parameter, but it's not going to fit best because I need to fit everything else together. And so we have sort of uh, an issue. That's where Bayesian estimation comes in. Uh, so I developed a Bayesian model that will sort of fit both of these, uh, the carbon and the oxygen values at the same time. Uh, how Bayesian estimation sort of helps with this is it takes in all of that uncertainty of what those initial estimates would be and allows you to sort of have a very clear statement of the uncertainty that you had going in ends up you still have uncertainty sort of coming out at the end. And so you have a lot more, you know, this is not now just a single line. Here's a bunch of different potential lines that could fit to this that have the same periodicity for both the carbon and the oxygen. Uh, because they're not getting so tightly fit to whatever particular samples that you happen to have. So this is what it looks like when you do have the budget for 22 samples of tooth. This is what it looks like when you have the budget for six samples of tooth. Yeah. Uh, but that's good, <laughs> even though it looks bad, uh, because I showed you the other one first. 
this is great because you should be less confident about a tooth that you only have six samples on. And so this is giving you, uh, it's giving you sort of the safety check of like, well, I really shouldn't be too incredibly certain about what's going on. All right, so just to very quickly, since I'm already under my five minutes left, uh, give you an example of some of these teeth that I did these six samples on. Uh, I work at this central Anatolian site uh, called Chattopoeic. Uh, there are a couple of people here who have heard of it, so they'll chuckle at anything I say about it. Um, but it's a Neolithic community. The people do uh, sheep, and, <laughs> sheep and goat pastoralism. They do wheat and barley agriculture. They live in houses together. It's great. It's Neolithic. It's very fun. Uh, it's around 9,000 years ago, which is different from the Neolithic here. Uh, even though the cattle for most of the site are uh, wild, uh, because they don't get domestic cattle until relatively late. Even before they have the domestic cattle, cattle play or oroxen play a relatively big role in how people uh, organize their lives, I suppose. They're the largest, they're the largest animal uh, in the area. They're also the or most common hunted animal that you get. Uh, and so people put them into their walls, uh, which is strange but interesting. Uh, Cattle play sort of a central role in a lot of these sort of bone clusters that we get that could be sort of uh, large enough communal feasting events that could have even fed the entire community. Um, Arzu Demerugi did some work that uh, looking at the amount of meat in some of these you could feed over a thousand people here. Uh, so cattle are sort of this big thing. And again, they didn't have refrigeration here. It's in the Konya Plain, which is a relatively warm area. Uh, and so Essentially, I wanted to look at the seasonal behavior of cattle uh, by looking at 22 uh, orox molars, their molar, mandibular molars, uh, from the earlier part of the site's occupation to see if the seasonal behaviors of cattle uh, varied in ways that would have affected how available they would have been throughout the year to the community. So this plot here shows, again, those average values. Uh, so this is sort of... Uh, averaged out for an entire year of the carbon on the x-axis and the oxygen on the y-axis uh, for these different animals. And they're all sort of largely, roughly the same time, though that same time is a long span. Uh, but what you can see is these larger circles reflect the uncertainty that we have. So for each individual animal, we have a good amount of uncertainty about uh, where its sort of average value would lie, because we only have six animals. Uh, some of them have even fewer because things fail and budgets are finite. Uh, but even with all of this uncertainty, we can see that there's this larger group uh, that's highlighted in red, uh, or larger, the higher oxygen group that's highlighted in red, that we can be very pretty reasonably certain, that's too many, very reasonably certain, <laughs> uh, that they have sort of a different kind of, uh, they're living in sort of more open environments, they're spending, so this is average over the years. So it's not just what summer they're in. Uh, I said that was last. Uh, <laughs> it's not just what summer they're in. It's what uh, they're living in environments that have more evaporation um, in general compared to the precipitation than these animals in the lower group. All right. To also sort of show, I guess I'll go quickly on this, some of the fun things that you can do with this is you can now start looking in uh, variability in the behavior. Uh, now that we have this, so we can look at birth seasonality. So again, the curves that we're seeing show uh, relative, or show these oxygen values with relative uh, relative uh, values of where along the year they are, based, or where along the growth of this animal is. And so we would expect that if we take a single fixed point of a curve, so if we take the peak of the summer, uh, we can say how variable are the peaks of the summer in terms of relative length of a year for an animal. If animals are all being sort of born at the same time, they should be hitting that same peak of the summer at the same relative time of tooth growth. Uh, so here I've shown sort of three examples of oxygen curves, and these red bars show four show essentially an estimate of where that peak of the summer should be in sort of absolute uh, distance from the tooth root and the sort of variability of that estimate. So you can see a couple are largely overlapping and others further <coughs> off. 
So one thing that could possibly be happening with this higher group versus this lower group, maybe they're being born in different seasons and animals have to live sort of in different kinds of populations this way. When we look at all of the birth seasonality, uh, again, this wax is showing that relative point of where that summer peak is. Uh, the red group is the high oxygen and the black is the low oxygen. There's no difference in this kind of birth season. In general, the birth seasonality is pretty constrained. Um, so these animals are only being born over maybe two to three months of time. Um, but uh, sort of in general, that's what's going on uh, with sort of looking at birth seasonality. There's not really a difference in how they're doing this. Another thing that we can start to look at would be seasonal diets. So again, doing the same thing of saying, okay, I've got a certain point on the oxygen peak that would tell me something about what kind of season I'm in. What does that mean for the same value or the same point in the carbon values? Because again, these should be coming from the same uh, material. They should be able to be associated this way. So we can look, this is showing sort of two examples of, here's a line for an individual. Here's where that peak is. There's where its carbon value is for the summer. We can see where is the lower peak or the trough, the deepest part of the trough for the winter. And there is its carbon value in red for what its diet is there. When we compare uh, that high oxygen group and that low oxygen group, when we compare the seasonal diets, uh, you get a lot of, uh, a good amount of overlap in the diet during the summer for both of these groups, but they separate out during the winter. And so you can see with this, even with this variation in the average sort of value for what this would be, uh, with that kind of uncertainty of only six samples per tooth, uh, we can still get at sort of reasonable ideas now of why or how these animals might be interacting, that they might be living in similar kinds of environments in the summer, even if they're not in the same physical space, but in the winter they're separating out into different kinds of environments. And that presumably could affect how people are hunting these animals. They're hunting in ways that are looking for specific kinds of environments, these animals are all gonna be in similar kinds of places in the summer, but you would need two kinds of different strategies if you're hunting them throughout the year because in the winter they're in different spaces. So very quickly, I have words on the slide. Uh, <laughs> you get uncertainty, uh, the average values separate out, and you can see, you can start patching this together to get different types of uh, stories going on. How do you them? Thank you.